Hello and welcome to the Build-A-Soil Tropical 10x10. Today's a big day because it's episode one. It's marking the very beginning of this 10x10 gorilla tent that my wife are gonna fill out as our tropical tent. A lot of times when you get into growing and you have a grow space and you start using indoor grow lights, you start to wonder what else you could produce for yourself and for your family. And so bringing it full circle, we have space, we have grow lights, we like growing our own food, and so we wanna show some of that, but we also wanna fill it with tropical plants, kind of make it where there's actually fruit, stuff that we cannot do on our Colorado vegetable farm based on the weather. This whole thing is not a planned mission. We don't have some process we're gonna take you through. We're just wanting to document it from the beginning so that when it's a food forest in there, you can see where we started. So today, we've got some plants that my wife had a few at home. We also picked some out locally at some stores. I ordered some coffee plants. We have a lychee plant coming, a lychee tree. Lychee, depends on how you say it, arguments. But she runs build -as -Well Family Farms and she has a really good green thumb. You probably know me the from food. the YouTube. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, if you've seen our YouTube series before, maybe you haven't, I typically run the 10 by 10 tent where I educate for how to grow cannabis. But this is different. We want something that we can talk about all of the different plants that have nothing to do with cannabis. So we're still gonna keep that going. That's our other 10 by 10 series. And here, we'll be able to keep the lights at a schedule that makes sense for the tropical series. And so when we go in there, we're gonna discuss how we control the environment, what the lighting schedule is, but more importantly, show you the plants right now before they're transplanted, what they look like. She runs all the vegetables using build soil principles. I run the cannabis using build soil principles. And we both have experience doing either or, but really she's got the most experience when it comes to volumes of plants, producing food, planting them, right? Like if you're gonna have a succession planting of seed that has to have a certain amount of time and you have to keep it all harvested, totally different than me just flipping it to flower and getting a harvest whenever it's finished. So we'll discuss some of those things. We also have some cactus that we're gonna be growing, some citrus, and we're also open to suggestions. This is the beginning. So I know you had some plants that you wanted to grow. What else would you like to see in there before we walk in? I mean, I'm from New Zealand, so we're gonna try and get a hold of some Bijoa seeds, which is a fruit that you can only get in New Zealand. But one thing I'd like to mention throughout all this is one thing we teach is that with the build the soil way, we can, you know, grow cannabis really well. We can grow veggies and even house my house plants. I have like an ex, you know extensive collection at home. When we feed build the soil products or you know root wise or some of the other products that we have here, and then we take care of them, transplant them, up pot, do some things like that. We see like dramatic results. So think it'd be great to share with you guys that you can do not just veggies, not just cannabis, yep. but also your house plants need love too. And there's a, the more we kind of get into it, the more people we learn uh, really love their house plants. They yep. get really weird on it. We've most recently come across some friends that, um, I mean, that's like his prized possessions is his house plants. And uh, some of the things that he's afraid to do would be pruning, transplanting, and runs into problems that maybe he doesn't know how to solve. So hopefully we can share that with you guys today that it's okay to do some of the things, or even if you just don't know what to do, um, how to make your house plants, also your veggies, cannabis, whatever, healthy and be excited when you look at them every day, so. Yeah, and one of the things I think that she's touching on is that they're just plants. And I think that we kind of compartmentalize them depending on how we're introduced to this. So if you've only grown house plants, a lot of times what I see is people have them in the original container they purchased them in, they're put on a window somewhere or they're put somewhere in their kitchen. And dried or watered once a month. And they're watered every <laughs> once in a while because the light's kind of weak and maybe they'll move it around and find a sweet spot where, hey, it seems to do okay right there. And it can go a lot further. And I think part of the reason why the no-till growers or cannabis growers have kind of hacked that is we make our own potting soil from scratch. And we're gonna teach you how to do that for your house plants and for anything else in your life. But when you've done that and you've made this special soil, you start wondering, hey, I wonder what the house plant's gonna do and all the houseplants go crazy. Put on new growth, flower, things that you've never seen them do before based on the fact that instead of the bare minimum of just really awful potting soil that may or may not hold too much water, present issues, no right? Then you're like, do I buy the, uh, the house plant feed or do I, it says fertilize once a year. Like it just becomes this thing where most houseplants that I see kind of survive. We wanna switch that into fully thriving and there's ways you can do it. You don't have to have a 10 by 10 tent, but this is our goal is to show you this. If you've got some extra space, you can create a paradise, an oasis. It could be snowing outside. You can come into 80 degrees, hum humid environment, oxygen producing plants, and have this sanctuary. And that's part of what we'd like to produce as well. 
but it all operates on the same methods. And now we have more confidence because obviously we've run the 10 by 10 series, we've shown you what we can do there. Lots of commercial cannabis farms use these methods. But when our vegetable farm, and she's producing tomato plants that go up to the ceiling and then are dro dropped and dragged and run around the whole greenhouse off one tomato plant, producing not a few tomatoes, but hundreds of pounds of tomatoes off of a plant over a season, and all that she's doing is the build a soil way. There's worms, there's some top dressing, there's soil testing. Incredible. So because of that, we want to show you that it works for everything. And that's part of our mission here is to show you that this does work for everything that you're growing in your life. Well, I wanted to say too that what we are always talking about when on our YouTube videos, cannabis or the farm, is that we're like trying to mimic nature. So when you go to environments and say, you know, Costa Rica, Hawaii, places where there's sun, humidity, water, all the things that plants need, it's very general. I mean, you've got like your succulents that maybe do better in like a drier environment, but they also do well in the environment that we're gonna try to, to mimic. Nature do, knows what to do. And there's rarely problems when nature's doing all the work. So yep. with the no-till living soil system, it is like he said, it goes across the whole board. It's not just cannabis, it's not just veggies, it's, it's any living plant. We Nature knows here. best. We have some house plants at home that we just got some LED lights that literally screw into our regular light bulb. And it is a game changer having a quality light over the house plants in an area that would normally be kind of dark. There's no windows and now they're thriving. And you walk in and it's like, instead of buying some art for the wall, it's like you have living art that takes over and everybody comments on it and they all want to look at the plants. And so I'd like to share that with you. Gorilla, uh, the reason why I'm mentioning it, this is the brand of Grow Tent. They were really kind and they donated this tent to us. And I think that it'll help Gorilla too because they can't share a lot of their customers' grows because they're growing cannabis. But there's a bigger and better use for a lot of these things. I know so many, I look around in Colorado, it's very regular to have a shop or a garage based on the weather we have out here. And oftentimes, if that was organized, tubbed out and racked out, you'd have extra space and you could easily have your own oasis. So let's stop talking about it. Let's get started. Let's start this journey together. A big part of what you're gonna see today is just us talking about the plants that are in there, showing you how it's starting, doing some initial transplanting, troubleshooting and planning. And then we're just gonna keep recording and show you what happens as we go forward. It may not be perfect, but yeah, <laughs> we're, gonna, okay. we're gonna do what we know best. <laughs> and we're gonna follow through. That's one of the things that gardening teaches you is just that discipline. And that's one thing that we've gotten good at. So I promise this series will have lots of content. We'll learn lessons together and areas that we're not an expert in. We'll be sure to make sure uh, to tell you and be transparent that we're learning as well. Uh, like cacti is something new to us and we're going to be planting some seeds. I'll discuss that. And we're doing an experiment that I want to share where they're sterilizing some soil and not others. And there's some arguments there. I want to bring those to the forefront, have those conversations. So when you're looking out there for information, you can see that we're gonna walk the walk, not just talk it, and we'll do this together. So let's get in here. <laughs> the, the first thing that I wanna to touch on is the lights, the environment, just the basics you'll see in here, because I know a few people might have questions. And if you've seen our previous series, that's great, but we're gonna revisit all of it because I wanna pretend like maybe someone's never heard of build a soil they're coming across this video, it's the first one in the series, and they just wanna kinda of get up to speed with what it takes. So this is a 10 by 10 Gorilla Tent, and their standard Gorilla Tent, it comes with a height extension of one foot. And so we went ahead and installed that. We've got plenty of space in our warehouse, and that's right here. So this extra foot is the height extension, and that's part of why we like the Gorilla Tent. So it's 76 degrees in here, and it's only 52% humidity. Normally it's 60, 70, 75% humidity. And that's based on this, which is reading the temperature and humidity, and it's going to be activating the grow lights, activating the humidity. Right now, since we're just getting started, I've got a standalone humidifier, and it's more than enough. But as we'll document that as we go. Any changes we make, we'll share with you on camera. This is just set, it's a standalone, and it's set, I believe, to 70%, and so it's gonna run until it hits that number. And when we have the tent doors open, this number drops pretty quickly, and so we wanna keep it all closed. As far as the lights go, these are High Grove. That's the, the brand, it used to be Timber. And we really like them because they're manufactured in California. They're shipped from there. I can talk to Dan, the owner, and he's very generous in discussing all of the choices from the materials, how it's built, very transparent. And they're the Magnolia 4 because there's four panels on there. And we only have two lights in this entire 10 by 10, and that's more than enough. Gwen has made a list of all the plants that we have in here and actually put some notes on there. And we're gonna update this and make it downloadable so that you can understand what we're basing the information off of. And on here, it's gonna say whether it's full sun, partial sun, any kind of notes about it. 
We also included whether it's toxic or not because some people might have little children grabbing on leaves or pets that might eat them. And we'll go over this as we go through the room. The other thing I wanna show you is the environmental control. So I mentioned the grow lights. This is the grow hub that we're gonna be using. It's, it's called Niwa, N-I-W-A. And it has an app on the phone and we set a recipe. And that recipe is the temperature, the humidity, when the lights come on, when they go off. And so just to touch base on that, most tropical plants are gonna be more equatorial near that line on the earth that is more tropical. And so that's gonna be shorter days, it's gonna be higher humidity, and it's gonna be more normalized. Like we're not gonna have freezing cold nights, we're not gonna have crazy, crazy hot heat. Here's the first episode. Can you think of anything that we need to talk about before we just start getting after it? I can say that from, from, my, from my experience, environment isn't just part of it, it's the part of it. Because it depends on what you're growing, but for my tomatoes especially, um, when I take them from like say the tent, they're ready to go in the ground in the greenhouse. If that environment is not where it's supposed to be and you haven't really checked on that, all your plants are gonna go, the health is gonna decline and it doesn't come back the next day. It is really important. So maybe your house plants, it's not as big of a deal, but on the, uh, on the farm or if you're going from like one place to another, it is really important. Your, your vapor pressure deficit, which I'm, I can let Jeremy explain that a little bit more, it's really, really important. If you have a, a humidities and temps and your plants drinking more than it should, it's just got to be perfect in some environments probably not as important in here, but uh, I think that environment is everything. <laughs> yeah, and part of this environment is what's gonna elicit the response from the plants that's gonna be pretty wild. You're gonna see faster growth than you normally see out of house plants. You're gonna see more flowers, colors, you might not flowers. See. And so at home, if you're not seeing that, a lot of times it's because there's very little light, not much humidity, and not much trigger for growth. But that's actually fine if all we want is an ornament. If you wanna see it really grow, you'll have to transplant it, give it more light, have a good environment because if it's growing fast, humidity becomes much more important. It's like a human can go to the desert and be on a hot day and maybe low humidity and be fine, but you start sprinting, now it's a problem. So the plants can just be chilling in your house and not realize there's an issue, but you might move them into a sunnier spot and all of a sudden they don't look good. Now they need that humidity, the water, the food, the stuff that comes along with that whole equation. So we will totally discuss that. I think on a future episode, we'll get deeper into VPD, the DLI, all these weird terms that become very simple once you understand them, but is quite a bit of detail to really bring you up to speed. So look for that in our future episodes. Today, let's just keep it simple. We've already done tons of talking. I just wanna show you around. So why don't we just show them the plants and let's get to work. Let's do some transplanting because there's plants in here that we don't even wanna show you because they're like in their original container. We just bought them or they were just brought from a friend's house. And we really wanna like, when you care for your plants, they're like babies. You're like immediately let's transplant this. And her and I both are like, well, we should probably film that. So let's wait. And so it's been the last week or two, we've really just been filling this up with plants and it's time. And this is a Circestis, uh, which is a pretty rare one. A Mirabalis, I think, is that what it's called? And so this is uh, from Africa. If I recall, do you want to tell me a little bit more about this one, babe? It's native to West Africa, okay. and it's usually found on the in the bottom of the rainforest, okay. and grows on the trees. It attaches itself to trees. It's actually a vine. So in your house plant setting, it's not going to grow into a vine. A rare house plant. Uh, it takes a lot, I guess, to get them from West Africa to the United States. When you come across one, you know it's actually the one plant in here that we're like don't die because a lot of the other ones, you know, are, are pretty easy to find. This one in particular is a rare house plant. And I think part of what we want to do here is share. So we've already been given a couple of gifts and I think that's part of what's so unique about house planting. In fact, when I met my wife and we had this passion for plants, one of the things that I remember she shared with me is that one of the house plants that we have was from a neighbor that she became good friends with who passed. And so she still has this plant. It was already 30 years old when I got it. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so there's more, like that's really cool. Obviously in cannabis, there can be like a rare cutting or strain, but a lot of times it's about what it produces and house plants can provide that. Now this one, it has some tips that are causing some issues, some burn here. That was more just from being under and overwatered in this little container that it came in. And this was just transplanted. This one being so rare, we didn't wait to do that on camera. We just put it in there. And I can already see some of the sheen on the leaf coming back, which means I know that it's gonna start to take off. And for me, it's not about the rarity, but it kind of is, right? I was like, ooh, a rare house plant, that sounds cool. I didn't know that really existed, meaning some of our friends, they go online and they order like expensive rare house plants and they create this whole collection. And I didn't know that was even a thing, but 
I can see how it becomes that way. It's like Pokemon. You just want to have like every variety of plant. And from traveling, since I was a kid, I was really lucky enough to be able to visit the Hawaiian Islands uh, a few times when I was a kid. And it just really left an impression on my brain. And that's something that we like to invite in our house is the amount of plants. You know, it can be winter, there's nothing growing around here in Colorado and to have beautiful plants that make you have that tropical feeling, big part of it, I think. For me personally, it's about taking care of something that's alive and not failing at it. I'm a mother and a wife and plants kind of go on to that side of things where I get to like have this thing, it's alive. You see the results when you take care of it and I really enjoy that. So this one in particular, uh, we won't see a lot of new growth uh, very soon, but these leaves apparently can get double this size. And so that's what we're looking for is to see the leaves kind of get bigger, more, more like drapey and uh, darken up as they, you know, feed on whatever's in the soil there. Um, we were gifted this one, it's a begonia. This was just yesterday, um, Kid Kaya dropped it off. He's a breeder and a local friend and he lives in Paonia and he told us this is a cutting that's just been going around Paonia for a long time and it has some history behind it and he wanted to share it with us and he gave it to us rooted. I haven't taken it out, but I think there's some roots yeah, hanging some in there. In there. Mm -hmm. So we'll be able to transplant this today, but I just wanted to pull it out right now because this is the time I was talking about how house plants can have stories. So if you've got a story about a special plant that means something to you, I'd love if you relayed that here in our YouTube channel. And if these plants start to do really well, one of the things that's great about nature is you can share them. You can take a cutting, you can give them away. And if it becomes possible where we have enough to share and people that are wanting to trade, it'd be fun to be able to get house, like house plants from some of you. Maybe stuff that is heirloom or important to you and we can continue that story. And it's possible that some of those will be shared back out to some of our viewers to keep this kind of library of plants going. And that's what's really a big part of it for me. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. We have some <laughs> ugly plants over here. And for me, normally, if you've seen our, our YouTube series, we really pride ourselves in having some of the most beautiful plants around. Because to me, that means that they're well-maintained, that you're doing your job as far as discipline and keeping up with what they need. On the farm, for sure, it teaches you that if there's a job undone, it needs to be done. There's no, ah, oh, I just get to that tomorrow or whatever. The problems, they don't stay the same in the farm, they grow and they grow quickly. And so really it's keeping chaos at bay. And a lot of times that translates to life. And when we see something like this and I show it, I'm almost embarrassed, but I'd rather be totally transparent. These, we didn't grow. We bought these from a farm hoping to bypass a year or two. And they are coffee plants. This is the Arabica. And I would like to go other, other varieties, but when you, when you research something, one of the things I'm a big proponent of is starting with the basic formula until you understand it and then break the rules and create your own way. And so for Build-A-Soil, we broke a lot of rules and we copied others to do so. And that was the living soil, having worms in your soil indoors, using compost and mulch and cover crop, things that they always said indoors you shouldn't do. It should be sterile and none of that. And so eventually I'd like to grow other coffee and learn about it. But the whole goal is to take these two plants and produce enough, even if it's only a half pound of coffee beans from the fruit and dry them and roast them and grind them and have our own cup of coffee. And one thing you'll learn about me is I love coffee. My <laughs> wife does too, but I just fully connecting the coffee bean. And so if this goes well, we'll be taking clones of these, planting more of them. And inside the retail store, I can see multiple areas where we could probably just hang a light and have more coffee plants. And I'm thinking if we have like a dozen, I can do some calculations on how fast they grow. Maybe I can harvest a couple pounds or more per year to have some really special cups of coffee. But if you wanna copy us, I'm gonna try multiple different methods. I'd love to send clones out in the future. From seed would have taken a long time. I think it's always the right way to go because growing from seed, you can grow it your way from the beginning. But I wanted to try my hand at this, so I just jumped online. Uh, I, I think it's like Fast Growing Trees or one of these random websites that had them in stock and I asked them to ship them. They didn't put a heat pack in there. I don't think there was an option. Maybe I didn't look and it's the middle of winter and this one was almost dead when it arrived. That one was doing slightly better, but I'm happy to report, although they look kind of haggard, some of these leaves are dropping as they had change in light and environment. All of the new uh, tips have growth on them. And so you can see here, there's new growth coming out and it's healthy looking new growth. And there's another leaf right behind it. So all of these are doing well. And then when I drop down here, I can see new growth coming out of multiple spots on the plant, just peering out of these little areas. So my, my feeling is that these are about to 180, but they're slower growing plants. We're only on, which I failed to mention, we're on 10 hours of light in here right now. We're gonna play with that a little bit, but some of these plants, like these are only like eight hour daylight plants and four hours a little more intense, the rest kind of shade. 
And so we're hoping that 10 hours is enough for all of them. But we want to produce some tomatoes, cantaloupes, other things that may require more light. So the goal will be to game that by talking about DLI and keep them in brighter light versus the others. So this one, same one, it's just looking a lot better already. A lot of new growth coming off this one. And so I'm optimistic that all these ugly leaves will be able to prune off of here eventually and have nothing but lush new growth in here. We have some moisture meters, some tools that we'll be able to relay the data on how wet is too wet. How should my soil drain? Because there's a lot of bad information. The house plant world, they're like, you only must use cocoa core or you can- Or sand, some people tell you, just put it straight sand. Yeah. So we wanna break through that and kind of teach you the, the reasoning behind a lot of those conversations so that you can make your own decisions. I think when you understand fundamentally why someone may say you can't do that. It may be that they can't do that because they overwater all the time. Or they've had a bad experience. Yes, or whatever it might be. So they've heard it from someone else. And a lot of this gets passed down with the house plant because people would just kind of say, well, this is what I was told. So we'll break through all of that. We'll have plenty of time to talk. Let's just get through okay. it so we can go transplant. Okay, so we have this aloe here. It's been sitting in build a soil for quite some time. And so we're gonna transplant that, take care of it, baby it, and you'll see new growth there. What are we gonna do over here? Um, over here, so we have some cantal, or I think they're more like a honeydew melon. That's a vine and they produce really well. Last year we planted them in the greenhouse thinking that they were cucamelons, but they were not cucamelons. They were from who we bought them from. I don't know how it happened, but they're they're big, the beautiful honeydew melons. Okay. We're gonna then, plant some lettuce mix. Today, just to get some food going soon, we wanna plant some greens because most people, when it comes to their family, like they see this space and they're like, well, how am I gonna grow all my vegetables from the grocery store? Well, even if we just start replacing a little bit, meaning you grow some fast growing greens, and now at dinner, your family actually fresh harvest greens that were alive minutes or hours before you eat them. What you're getting there is you're getting all of the enzymes and you're getting more living vital food that goes into your gut. And a lot of human health is related to this microbial process in our gut and our ability to take food up. And we relate that to the soil because the soil doesn't have a stomach, but it uses cation exchange. And that's a similar a, a way to exchange nutrients just like when we eat food. It's all about that nutrient source. And so we'll be discussing that as well. And even though it's not a ton of food, lettuce grows quickly. And if you eat a little bit each day, you're getting your own vital, fresh, living food every single day. And it'll every grow day. back and be ready to harvest again in the again next again like week or so. And then we'll start to add other crops that we will have some pretty bountiful harvests. And we'll show you, we'll weigh it, we'll like document how much we get. And we'll be able to feed our family and take this food home for us as well. So okay. I'm not sure what we're gonna do there but uh, we may just leave that one blank for the day. We wanna have tons to do in the future. Today we'll plant some seeds there and then go over the back rack. <laughs> it's the silver sword. Silver sword. That's what okay. it's got, uh, called. The shape of the leaves and the color and how stout it was. And I just thought it looked really cool. And the soil that it's in is actually decent. I was digging in there, there's black lava rock and there's like wood chips and stuff. And normally the soil that we see is like perlite peat moss. And so I actually, whoever produced that, they, they had a great well, soil it's recipe. from a local grow store here in town and she's, she knows what yeah. she's doing. So this one is the hibiscus, uh, Chinese hibiscus. I happen to have a pet iguana at home and so I really wanted to bring this one in here because they eat the flowers off of them. And you know, when you trans we transplant it, we put it in living soil, it's gonna be all organic and I'm gonna like to feed that to my iguana. Yep. Like if you have an iguana, you'll realize it's amazing because we learn a lot about the, f the food that we put in our soil and the food that we eat. But you know, to me, I'm like spinach is good, lettuce is good, it's all good for you. And then someone comes along and goes, if you eat too much spinach, it has um, calcium. The oxalates. Oxalates in it, right? Mm -hmm. And you're like, what? I didn't know. So even in nature, good things, you have to have balance. You don't want to eat all just one thing. Well, and I'm finding out when I'm researching these plants and I'm looking into them and are they toxic, yes or no, whatever. That's the main thing I come across is the reason why most plants that are house plants are toxic to the, your animals is because of the calcium oxalate. There's yep. different oxalates that are poisonous to humans and pets, but um, a lot of your house plants are just full of them. So, and the iguanas are really sensitive. And the so we have to pick particular sensitive. greens. We grow some on the farm for them. They will eat almost anything and they really can't, they haven't even been able to find out in the wild, say like Mexico or wherever iguanas are native to. They know what they eat, but they don't really know how it affects them. So there's some plants that they're like, yeah, that one's like, could be okay, but, they, but they're not, not for sure. Yeah. So the only thing you could probably even grow in your iguana habitat is apparently a hibiscus. Um, and even then you'll never see the flowers because they'll just eat them so <laughs> right away. <laughs> so it, it'll be really fun to take some of these home and feed them to him. 
and they don't have pesticides on them. I mean, you can't just go to the grocery store and mm -hmm. buy some flowers. They're going to be covered in stuff that you would never want your pet to have. Ever. So yeah. one of the benefits, if you have any pets, you can grow really good food for them. I don't care, turtle, like whatever it is, this is something that you can do. So yeah, both my, uh, the manager and the farm and I, we have pets at home. She's got turtles and whatnot. And so we're right now this winter growing chard and mustard greens just for our animals. So that's been really fun to provide that for them here. This is the rubber plant. You can see that it is just really happy with whatever soil you've put it in and the light. Yep. Um, just the just the environment alone has really helped out this plant. So it's, really it's loving it. You can see the leaves, how one it's darker on this side and lighter here. It's because they open and part of the leaf is seeing the light for like a whole half and a day longer. Out. Over here, I really love this plant. It's called, it's called the mandarin plant, but um, this one in particular is an air purifier. It's part of the spider plant family. So if you do know spider plants, they purify the air. This one is the same thing. I would have never known that because it's called a mandarin plant. So I would have thought that <laughs> mandarins were gonna come from it, but I think that's a tree. And then I wanna show you real quick. I mean, we've got a little bit of new growth on this one since we brought it in, but as you can see, it's still in the, the same container that we bought it in. It's got, if you look underneath, it's got some damage here. So it'll be really fun to show you guys how we transplant. It'll be exciting to share the uh, progress it makes. Down here, I love, the, I don't know why I love the name of this one, but it's called the Zanzibar. And it's a Zanzibar gem. You can see in this soil here, so we've had a couple leaves drop. Looks like maybe there's like some, some weird fungus growing up there. But the one thing that I noticed, first of all, yesterday was that it smells. Um, that shows me that it's overwatered. It's yeah, probably in really plant. crappy soil. And these nutrient. were on the back rack, like save me at discount. In the cold, oh, yeah. yeah, they were in the cold. So that's called the Zanzibar gem. Uh, I think there was a fun fact about that one. Let me look here. It's native to South Africa. Uh, my whole entire family is from South Africa. So once I found that out, not only do I like the name Zanzibar, but um, that's really cool. A little bit of like yeah, family history awesome. there. The other one that we brought in for color that I really love is the Flamingo Lily. It says to wash your hands after handling this plant because it's got toxic something on the leaves. And this one in particular says when you've touched it, I didn't really look too much further into that, but it said very strictly like wash your hands. Yeah, so if you so, grow Flamingo Lilies, do you know if that's if that's true? Wonder, Should we really be I concerned? I if it's toxic <laughs> in a certain type of way. Yeah. yeah, so we're gonna transplant it and we're hoping that it produces tons of beautiful Lily's I also out. love the name begonia and uh, <laughs> we have like three different begonias. This one is the Rex begonia. As you can see, it's got little spikies around the edge. Um, we have two other begonias in here, a watermelon begonia. Oh, that was the cool fun fact about this one. Apparently when you grow it in short sun hours, short daylight hours, you'll start to see it flower. And if you have long hours, it's just going to grow lanky and long and that's okay too. But if you really want to see it produce some flowers, it likes shorter days. Cool. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. And in your kitchen, maybe you can't control that, but in here we have full control. It's pitch black in here. If we turn the light off just real quick is we've got some cactus and the, so Ooh. these are San Pedro's and I've got two of them and they've been kind of hardened off. Uh, their cuttings and so we'll talk about it instead of me trying to show you nothing i'll open them and we'll actually transplant them and, and talk to you about how to transplant those so here we have okay so there's another another plant that's kind of interesting and fun these are money trees you can pretty much find them at any grocery store that you walk into we have like a thing about them but when i met jeremy he was like you know this is like the symbol of prosperity and so it's really cool because i've also fell in love with them one thing that i messed around with and that i've done is I cloned one just for fun. I didn't even know if I could, but I did. And it was really awesome. And we've got it growing at home. And uh, usually you buy it from the store like this and you keep it in this little pot and that's all fine and dandy. But what I've done at home is transplant them into a little bit bigger mm -hmm. pot with build a soil soil. And they are monsters, like they are insane. And uh, I really wanna show you guys how I did that and show you what results you can get when you do up yeah, you might think like, oh, I better not touch that, right? Yeah. But she actually really cloned bigger. several cuts off of it. They rooted really well. She put them next to each other and braided it and everything. Yeah, it's been really fun to mess with at home. And the leaves, like, 
this one, I mean, the, my ones at home are, are massive. massive. And the, it's just a big tree. And apparently these can grow like 30 feet tall if you put them in your home. Um, so you may think it's like a dwarf plant, but it's not. You just give it a little extra root Limited space. Limited by root space. Uh-huh. Yep. So that one's really cool. Okay. So there's two different names for it. There's the Pachera glabra or there's the Pachera aquatica. They look almost identical. And uh, according to the, the Googles online, the only way to tell the difference between the two plants would be the fruit that comes out of them. So one of them has like a, a seed pod uh, with seeds in it, a big pod, it's a fruit. And then the other kind actually just grows flowers. So it would be really fun to see if we could maybe get them to fruit and flower. I don't know yeah, how we would do that. For sure what so we could know exactly which one we have. Yeah. And then this one here, the next one we have. That is the watermelon begonia. It was in too bright a light for a little bit. It doesn't like to be, it kind of curled up. It's in soil that was waterlogged. And so we're gonna transplant this one as well. One thing that I thought was kind of cool about that one is that those plants in particular grow on the rainforest floor. Typically that plant grows underneath all the other plants in the rainforest. So it'll be fun to see if it can handle some of the, the strong yeah. light. I'd like to have lots of plants out of the direct light too. So we can have this dual environment. Most definitely. Okay, well, let's get to transplanting. I'm putting it right there. Okay. <laughs> As a reminder. Okay, so well, we're gonna start with what this am I one. grabbing first? Okay, so let's get fabric pot, right? For this one, that was the first one we were gonna go to. That's it. So these are grassroots living soil pots. You can use whatever you want for your house plants. We're taking tools that we already have that we really like. This one is fabric, but really it's recycled plastic. And so it's not gonna like break down. It lasts a long time. This one has a liner that they've sewn on into it. And that's what they known as the living soil container. We work with living soil. This allows the soil to retain moisture, the worms to be happy and not dry out from the sides so quickly. This may not be the end all be all answer. It's just one of many containers that we have. And so because of that, we thought this particular size, this three gallon would be a big upgrade from its current home. And then if this gets full and big, we can decide to keep it in here or transplant at another time. So here is the three gallon. Let me grab some soil for you. This is Build-A-Soil Light. We have lots of recipes here at Build-A-Soil. I'd like to mention too, real quickly, the reason why, for, in my mind, when I think of the light soil, it's not gonna be super heavy on nutrients, so you have the option to feed your on your own. Yep. And then also it's gonna drain a lot better. You can use it for seeds and things like that. It's not gonna become waterlogged if you have a small plant that's not drinking as much. So. For especially this plant right here, one thing I'd like to talk about is that fact that it's very wet. And when I think of root rot or overwatering, this is what I think of. I yeah. think of a plant that's starting to die off, it's drooping, it can't really handle itself. It's like literally drowning. So you may be really tempted to just pull all this nasty stuff off, but then if you give it any water, it's not. there's nothing, for, nowhere for it to try to go. So I typically am not gonna try to pull off any of that dead stuff until I see new stuff growing. And that's just me, you know, you can do okay. what you do. You wanna get this in there? <laughs> yeah, totally. Okay. A little bit of soil. I don't know how much. That's all. probably good for now. As I'm transplanting, I would like to talk about too, the depth of your plant. You know, some plants it matters, some it don't. Tomatoes in my greenhouse, I can take the plant and plant as deep as I want and cover up part of the stalk and there'll never be an issue. A lot of plants, you can't do that. You'll end up r rotting your stalk, so. Um, you can see here I've got it right in the middle and it looks pretty much good. I've got about an inch there. So why don't you fill it up for me? Okay. Sounds good. And then I got a water can. Mm -hmm. We'll put some root wise in there. Talk about that for a minute. What do you think? Is that good? Yeah, that looks good to me. And I'm putting new plants in. First of all, get it centered. Second of all, what you want, you don't want to like leave all your soil really loose because now you've got this really loose plant. So I like to, I call it like tucking it in like a little baby. I'm just going to press it down so that everything's nice and solid in there. Not too many air pockets or anything weird going on. Um, you can add some more soil. I like to go about an, an inch below the, the rim of the pot. So let's add a little bit more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we believe is that in the forest floor and anywhere in nature, there's normally not bare soil. If there's fallen leaves and there's decaying logs and there's plants growing and there's like a covering. And so one of the things when it comes to sustainable farming is always having a cover crop, always having the skin layer that protects the organs underneath, so to speak, on the soil. And that's using a mulch layer. And so we'll probably put some mulch on in the future, but I just wanted to mention it for now in case some of our diehard fans are like, what? Don't you, you want to water it a little bit? I will let you do that. Okay, well, let's, uh, <laughs> whoa, we got a houseplant. <laughs> okay, so real quick, when we have a plant, 
that's struggling, this biology can help keep the rotting biology because in nature, it's not good or bad. They just have jobs to do. So if there's root rot in there, then nature's saying, all right, I'll eat the whole plant, right? I'm, gonna, I'm nature's cleanup crew. We're gonna put some beneficials in there and clean it up and hopefully these will interact with the plant and allow it to take up nutrients faster and healthier because we're not using chemical nutrients. The RootWise microbe complete, a tablespoon of let's say five gallons of water. That's kind of the uh, an introductory simple drench. Since we have a whole bunch of plants to do today, I'm just gonna follow the simple method and I'm gonna put a little less than a tablespoon in here since there's only like three, four gallons of water, not five. You can measure this exactly or you can just kind of do it like I do. I have another product that is the Kuyaha extract. This is from the soap bark plant and it's high in sap and it makes like a natural soapiness. When you have fresh soil, sometimes it doesn't hold water very well or the water moves around kind of strange. And so this will allow us to make the water a little bit soapier where it'll spread through the soil instead of just dump out the bottom. So I'll add a little bit of that in there and that's all we'll add today. This one is very small amount. I only add like a half teaspoon in there and that'll be plenty. Seems like a lot, but it's barely putting any water down right now. Okay, that one well, is we'll done. Well, we'll see if it's saved. That's one of them. One down. The croton. One of the crotons. Yeah. Okay, so the one I just planted had a really long stalk. It was okay to put just a little bit at the bottom, put it in there, and then cover it up. This one is more of a shallow uh, root ball here that we're going to put in. The, you know, when you see like black, black soil like that, it's already wet. So. One of the things we just did with that one is we transplanted it and we gave it a little bit of water. If you transplant and give them a ton of water when they're already really wet, they're never gonna establish their roots or it'll just take a really long time. And so we're just gonna set that in here. I like to make sure everything is in the middle because I'm OCD. And then we kind of just tuck it in. And one thing you'll see here is uh, that top layer that was that's the pre-made or where it came from is exposed. I want to cover that up just a little bit. So we're going to add some soil in there so we don't have that just sticking out. Because once you water it and that soil goes down, then you're just going to have that part sticking up and it's going to um, dry out a lot quicker and still not have that nice soil to attach into. Maybe one more scoop. One other thing before we get done with this is, can you hand me the scissors? Yeah. I'm being lazy because I just recently had hip surgery, so I'm not getting up and down a whole bunch. One thing I'd like to mention here is when I scanned this with like my little plant app, it was like, that plant is unhealthy. And that's mainly because there are some leaves that look bad. But one thing I don't like to do is just have a bunch of foliage sitting on the soil itself. So it's okay to prune, which a lot of people don't know that. And I'm just gonna come in and take off some of these ones that are super down low and let that plant kind of just get itself established without potential rotting going on or anything like that. So I'm taking off just these really lower ones around the bottom here. One of the things I was reading about houseplants is uh, when you prune, just like the tomatoes and cannabis as well, promotes new growth. So um, it really helps to clean up dead stuff and make sure that anything that looks bad is out of there. I think that was it. I got one other leaf right here and that's okay, it'll all grow back. Obviously nothing's gonna happen from the transplant by tomorrow, but in the next two weeks, you're gonna see some really healthy growth coming off of here. And that will start that whole process where in a year from now, you're not gonna recognize this tent. It's gonna be a jungle in here. And starting it now gives us something fun to do, but it just evolves and turns into something incredible as time goes on. Where would you like it? I'm not sure. And this is the beginning. So we haven't figured out how we're gonna do the vertical, but we wanna have multiple heights in here. So I put a rack, cause we had it, and we'll start to just plan and figure out. Maybe we'll put some pedestals to raise some plants up, but this is just the beginning. So you'll see everything that we do. I think that's mainly it. I wanna to get to planting the seeds. So if you're out of here, I'm gonna say bye. Okay, bye. You out of here? See you later. All right. <laughs> okay, so we were able to do a pretty good amount of going through the tent, probably just too much, but I wanna show you everything. So I'd rather over document, let you skip around and watch the video however you'd like. What I promised myself we'd do today is besides a couple of transplants, is get some seeds planted. And so let me see what I've got here. I've got some 12 seed cover crop, which is huge in farming. 12 seeds provides a lot of diversity, lots of clover, legumes, things that will help fix nitrogen, improve the soil. And just to get something growing in here in these coffee plants, I'm gonna plant some cover crop. For today, I just wanna get some seeds in here. 
for me, this is gonna help. This is a slow growing plant. I don't have any water in the reservoir right now, but eventually when it grows faster, I wanna put water in. These seeds will really help drink water, feed the biology, and just get this soil cranking with life. And the way that I do it with cover crop doesn't have to be perfect, I'm just spreading the seed around. So I'm just gonna grab kind of a handful and I'm just gonna sprinkle this all around. And I'll show you how I get it into the soil. I'm just gonna take my fingers and, and wiggle it a little bit so that all these seeds come into surface contact with that soil and are sure to germinate. Uh, at your house, if you ever spread grass seed, you can just kind of rake it in. You don't have to mulch it. And so I'm just basically making sure that I'm at least doing the minimum here. Now I'm just gonna press it down with my hands to make sure the seed kind of stays in its location, doesn't all pool up in one area when I water. That's good. I'll do the same thing over here. And I'm just gonna water the surface here to make sure all of this cover crop seed is moist now. And they'll start to germinate within the next couple days. And that's just more life here in this, in this grow tent. It's gonna be something else to watch grow and it gets beautiful. There's beautiful flowers on the cover crop. I'll be able to just mist the top of this each day to make sure the cover crop germinates. And then in about five, six days, I won't have to do that anymore because it'll just be growing and it'll actually change the conditions. It'll stay a little more humid around the surface of the soil because of all the plant growing and transpiring. Let's see, what else can we do today? I'm having fun. I know we got some transplants done and it's clear that we need to transplant the Zanzibar. I need to transplant the Flamingo Lily, but we'll probably record another episode tomorrow, the next day, and just finish recording all of the transplants. Otherwise, I'm gonna be in here for like two more hours today. This is the hybrid specialty melon. And so on the back, anytime you get a pack of seeds, it usually says some basics. Direct seeding rate, 30 seeds for 10 foot, 100 seeds for 50 foot. Pretty standard on a farm to have a certain measure of row feet that you're using. Really, I probably just need one plant in here. I'm gonna plant three seeds just to make sure we get the healthiest, most vigorous one out of all three. And then we'll leave one plant in there. This is what the seeds look like. And what's great is once we're done with these seeds, we can produce thousands of our own seeds because each melon will have plenty of their own. So those are the three seeds that I'll use. Um, normally I would like to pick seed, but they all look so uniform in here. I'm not gonna really pick. Like if I get tomato seeds, I dump them all out and I look for the thickest, best ones. And I plant those first. Rule of thumb for me when it comes to seeds is the size of the seed is about as deep as you wanna go. So with a really small seed, I throw it on the surface and I barely touch it into the soil. With something like that, I wanna plant it just a little bit further down, like quarter inch deep in the soil. Let me just tamp it down in this area so that it doesn't float away once I plant it. I'm gonna put one seed right there one seed over to the right of it and one seed to the left of it. And that way, no matter which one of those grow, it'll be, have the opportunity to grow up the vine. And so then I'm just gonna push it in with my finger so that that divot goes down about a quarter inch and I'm just gonna cover it with soil. Tamp it down and that's it. Now it's a quarter inch deep. I didn't go too deep on it, which is a problem because it can rot. It can't really quite push its way through. Whenever I think of that, I kind of laugh a little bit because you'll see a plant growing out of concrete on the sidewalk and you're like, well, I don't know. Just want to give it a good shot, right? I'm just going to wet this. I'm, I'm watering the whole area just to keep it moist for the worms and everything. And I'll probably put, I'm probably going to put the holy basil in here as well. Now last is I'd like to label it. I don't want to forget. I've got a lot of stuff going on in here. And so to keep it simple, I've got these little plant tags that we had an abundance of. Okay. Let's see, we've got a local seed producer that we have some of last year's seeds. And I've got several different basils, let's see. Lemon basil, toothache plant, holy basil. Okay, man, I almost wanna do more basils in there, but <laughs> should I plant them without her here? I think I wanna wait for my wife and pick out where to plant all these just because we're gonna do it together. But the holy basil, Coot taught me about this. This is the Tulsi. And he really mentioned that it's a very special plant and that everyone in India has their holy basil. There's the Krishna, the, I'm gonna ruin it, but the Tulsi is the one that I've grown the most of. It smells like bubble gum. Like it's, it's an unreal terp on there. I really like it. We can make some medicinal teas. We can make some plant food out of it. And it's got really small seeds. And so this one says indoor, just direct seed. Once the soil is warm, plant a quarter inch deep and thin to four to eight inches apart. Begin to harvest when six to eight inches tall, pinching the leaves from the tip of the stem to encourage branching. If you've ever grown basil, pruning it's pretty important. Otherwise it starts to grow flowers and starts to get a little bit bitter. This is slightly different. It's a medicinal version. It's not the culinary type, but I still want to take it seriously. Inside here, some of the seeds already fell out. So I'll probably use those, but there's like, there's such small seeds that come with an inner packet a lot of times, but that's how small holy basil seeds are. It's ridiculous. And so quarter inch deep to me seems a little bit deep. 
I'm just gonna put holy basil on one side. I'm gonna put it right over here. And so what I'm gonna do just visually is I'm gonna draw just a line down here and I don't wanna go too close to that other seed, but just like a line right down here. And I'm gonna take some of these seeds and I'm just gonna kinda of go down the line making sure that it just drops in there. In fact, for good measure, the seed is so dang small. I'll just put them in here and we'll thin them out a little bit later. And I'm just gonna sprinkle. These seeds being a couple years old, I just wanna make sure we get some germination. Probably have a seed on my hand. <laughs> now I'm gonna seal it with some water and make sure that those seeds get everything they need. This root wise will really help. Those are now moistened and ready to germinate. I'm going to get another plant label so that I know where the holy basil is. And I'll just put it right here so we know this side of it is the tulsi. And this is great, it's bare now, but pretty soon we're not gonna have bare soil. There's gonna be vining up with melons, a fruit that I can eat. There's gonna be holy basil down below. This build us soil away. Not only works well for house plants, but it produces really good nutrient dense food for you and your family. So we've now got holy basil, we've got the melon, I wanna go one step further and we're gonna plant more on camera. We've got lots of content and I don't wanna make this first episode too long, but I wanna at least get stuff kicked off on this first episode so we have stuff to look forward to. I wanna plant at least some lettuce. Lettuce is really quick growing. You could harvest the entire crop of lettuce once a week if you wanted to and it'd grow back in the next week's time, at least two weeks if you go really deep on it. But when you don't harvest the whole area and you're just going around harvesting what you wanna eat that day, you can harvest from it every single day and still have more by the time you get back to your first harvest location. Some spinach, some broccoli, we'll get to that soon. These are the butterhead lettuce. And I know, I believe this is the, we've grown lettuce heads before and I wanna grow that, but I swear we had the lettuce mix that I wanna grow. I'm gonna call her and ask where those seeds are. I'm calling her right now. <laughs> Where's the lettuce seed that we normally grow? Okay, so I found the lettuce mix. And this is the five-star greenhouse lettuce mix. We've grown a lot of this. That's what we're gonna use here. From Johnny's Seeds, they do a great job. And I'm gonna use an earth box because it really grows produce phenomenally well. This soil has been recycled. So it's been, it's been grown in before and we harvested all the plants and we just kind of left it. Now, because of that, it's got a little bit of like a firm layer on the top from all the roots, fluffing it back up. I'm not really tilling it. I'm just going through the very top layer making sure it's not all crusted out and hard. I want these seeds to have kind of a soft seed bed to go into. Okay. So I've got like three basically bands. I'm gonna put these in and we can just go and harvest through and it'll fill up completely, but at least I'm not having seed on seed on seed because when you get deep down into the lettuce, you don't want it rotting underneath there. That's more work when you get to the kitchen. Lettuce seeds, real small, looks like rice almost. But as I go down here, I'm trying not to bury seed all on top of each other. You can tell when someone's done a really good job in the greenhouse when the seed just pops up all at the same time perfectly. And it's like art when it's done right. That's all I needed. I've got three rows of this lettuce mix. Plenty of seed left for the future. The last, I wanna water it and cover it. So let me just move this row, cover this row a little bit. Just kind of tucking it all in. Now I'm gonna put some pressure so that when I water it, it doesn't float around. Now we have food started. We have some medicinal, the, tul the tulsi going, and we have some fruit. Plus we have the coffee and we've, we're just getting started. In the beginning, there's just a lot to do to get it kick-started and that's half the fun, but I don't want you to miss out. So we're gonna do our best to try and document all of it. Let me get the label like I promised myself or I'm gonna forget. Our lettuce. Just move this back here and we'll leave it. With the earth box, they come with a plastic cover. And if you're transplanting, you can do that. Like if I had whole lettuce heads in a tray, I could cover it, cut out a little hole in the mulch and put it down. Because we're not using that mulch layer and I have lots of seed, I'm gonna leave it open. And this is gonna be so full of lettuce, it'll just block and cover the soil on its own in sheer plant volume. But we also will show you other ways where we use mulch and we discuss all those different pros and cons. Other than that, I have so much more to cover today. It would take me hours, so I think we're just gonna end the episode and leave some more content for the coming days. We have more transplants to do. We have that uh, begonia from Paonia that needs to be transplanted. The aloe pups that need to go right away. I've got some cactus seed that we haven't discussed yet, and I'm gonna plant from seed. I've also got these cactus that need to be transplanted, and so I'm just gonna break it down. Uh, maybe tomorrow or the next day I'll record another episode, and I'll get as much of that done as possible. And then soon we'll be to a place where we're more just watching what happens instead of getting everything started. But until then, I really appreciate you watching our first episode. 
This has been the Build a Soil Tropical YouTube Series 10 by 10, episode one, day one. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this, subscribe, hit the like button, tell your friends about it. I really wanna get loaded up in here of comments. We're gonna learn a lot together. And so the more of us that are in here asking questions, providing feedback, sharing plants amongst each other, the better. And if you've got questions, put them in here. We do frequently asked question videos where I'm gonna go through user questions and I'm gonna answer them on camera for you. Until next time, we'll see you on the next Build a Soil Tropical episode.